Hello everyone, Nerblin here and welcome back to the Adyne Mod. Today we're doing another quick tips video, this time on LaFlorian, a faction that I've been constantly up on the up and down about. Anyway, let's begin as we always do with the units. In smaller groups, the swordsmen are better at being able to escape from danger or engaging in conflicts where the enemy wants to escape but then is pincered by their attack. The Lorian archers are probably the best unit to practice using the ambush of the wood elves ability because the bonus damage they gain for 20 seconds just makes them almost as powerful as other archers with upgrades. If you keep some of these pipemen hidden alongside your archers they can just bait out enemy cav without taking any substantial damage. If you prefer to keep all, you, all your units in a command group together I recommend keeping the minstrels out of that command group because they can't attack so if you do an attack order They'll just run, run in front and die, or if you attack, uh, press to attack something, they won't move. So it's better to keep them as a single, u single entity group. Just have them use their sing, have them walk around. But make sure they don't actually go into melee, because they will die. They are quite squishy. If you find yourself going against heavily armoured units, I recommend switching Sungalathrim to swords, because they do auric damage, which if I've already mentioned before, it goes through enemy heavy armor so it makes it even more efficient against late game units making Galathrim with swords just as powerful as Galathrim with silver fawn arrows. Don't let the light armor of the Karas Golathon Guardians fool you they are actually quite tough plus they can easily be disguised within your Lorian archers if you choose to keep with them just because of the way they look. It'll be hard to tell them apart once everything has silver fawn arrows. For the Mirkwood units, I'm going to kind of compare them to the Lorian units because even though they are, have very similar traits, there are also some key differences. Firstly, with the Swordsmen, they are more of a frontline tank unit. They have a formation that can give them more armor at reduction of damage. Put that with the Guard Stance, and these things can last forever while your Archer line does all the killing. The Mirkwood Archers prefer to be in a defensive stance where they can slow down their enemies and even knock them down if you use the Ambush of the Wood Elves ability, making them perfect for just holding the enemy in place to get themselves killed by their arrows. The Pikemen of Mirkwood are very similar to their Lorian kin, the main thing being they can just hold out a little bit longer because of their extra health compared to the speed of the Lorian Pikes. Although I have dismissed the Elk Riders of Mirkwood in the past, I have to admit if you're worried about constantly getting cavalry charged, just having these around to actually counter enemy cav is far more efficient than just having pikes around everything and hoping the blob will survive. Because having these mo the mobility of the elk riders just gives you so much pushing power. And as Lothlorien, you can always use more pushing power. The palace guard are distinct in that instead of having formations that just give them a boost in some fashion it actually changes their weapon from pike to sword but also when in pike mode they have edge protection for themselves when near an M Merkwood building but when they're near a hero in their sword form they actually give them more protection so it's a nice little bit of a mix between both but I personally prefer to keep them in pikes on at all times just because I want the extra pikes don't let their large bulk fool you unfortunately Bionings even in their bear form are quite susceptible to archer fire. Their low health really doesn't let them survive long against a whole volley of one unit of archers being able to kill them in one volley. It does unfortunately suck, but it doesn't mean they're not powerful. They just need to use them as surprise attack units because they, they can't hide because of how large they are as well. It is just good better to have them when archers aren't around, personally, in my opinion. The Ashent is designed to be your battering ram, for, the, for Loth Lothlorien, however, it also has the stomp that the Mountain Giants gained when they arrived in Edain. But this version is almost as strong as that Mountain Giants stomp. And of course, next, the Oak Ent is your catapult unit. Which I'd say has more resistances in total, but can also just be as easily overwhelmed as it's not very good at turning. But it can hide in trees, so use that to your advantage if you want to get a sneaky approach on an enemy. Okay, and now moving on from the units, we have buildings. Starting with the Lorian 4, we have the Border Guard House, which is the way we produce our Lorian basic units. I recommend 
getting two of these, even in the beginning of the game, just get two. They're cheap and they make your units cheaper, which is what you want as Lothlorien because money really matters. The Sanctuary, on the other hand, you can wait until about the mid game before you get one. But I still recommend getting at least one of them because the upgrades you get from it are essential. It's the way you get your pantry upgrades and it also gives you some extra buffs which we'll be going over shortly in the upgrades. The Galathrian Quarters is another one of those buildings you can kind of go a little while without. Maybe even an entire game without. But it depends upon your certain play style. Some people don't need the Galathrian Quarters to win. Just basic luring units are all they need. And I've seen it happen. I've made it happen before. It does work. But if you want to have Former Galathrin, if you want Celeborn, you do need this building as well. And lastly, we have the most essential of the basic Lorien buildings, the Forge. You should try and push to get your economy built upgrades as soon as possible from this building because it'll make your money better, it'll improve your defences. It's just all good. You, you need this building if you want to be able to make it to the late game. Because the Manon Tree is your only building that actually generates any supply routes, you should try and get as many of them as possible at all times. Also, at level 3, you can choose to get extra vision, hide your units, or weaken the enemy, depending on your situation. All of which are very situational, but also very valuable for a cheap, a very cheap price. With the Bionning Homestead, you have the choice of either improving your military by getting Bionnings, or improving your economy by harvesting bees. You always have to juggle these these things, but I typically just have the for the economy and for getting Grimbayorn. The first Ent you recruit from the Ent Moot should almost always be Quick Beam because of its extra recruitment speed. It just makes having your Siege Army summoned out even faster and, and can be summoned straight from the doorstep of your enemy, making it a very essential settlement if you want to try and finish the game quicker. Although I do harbour a little resentment to this building, I still do understand the value it can offer. If you want to focus on getting discounts for certain units, you can then just get the, whatever buildings you don't have in your main base and get them here. Although, I do need to mention, you can't get your economy upgrades from this fortress and you can't get special upgrades that the sanctuary can give. The best thing to put this in purely is for the Galathrum Quarters. Just don't get any Galathrum Quarters in your main base and focus it on here. Or vice versa, have all Galathrum Quarters in your main base and focus on your basic units on the outpost. The choice is yours. Because of Lothlorien's base design, the Merkwood Outpost has as much value as a your basic camp start. Not so much a castle start, but a basic camp start has four build plots and so does the Merkwood Outpost. And you can tailor this to however you want to focus it. You want to get your basic units, you want to get elite units, heroes, money, healing, you've got it all. And it forces your opponents to adapt to that situation you put them into. Which does give you a nice little edge over them. I have been fooled many times by a Lorian AI to suddenly spawning a Merkwood outpost out of nowhere and then spamming units. Because it is ridiculous how good this building is. Alrighty, and next we have our upgrades, which Lorien actually has quite a few stylized upgrades that are specific to their faction. Firstly, we look at the Sanctuary, we have four different upgrades. This one is the same as what I've already mentioned with Gondor, so I'm going over quickly first. The Silver Fawn Arrows, you've seen, it me, you've seen me use it all the time on YouTube in my other battle videos. It gives all your archers that are protecting your base, Silver Fawn Arrows, beautifully powerful and should always be fo focused on if you're trying to defend the base more. Concealing Fog just makes it so you can use your Ambush of the Wood Elves more regularly. It helps you to just make your enemy guess what is in your base before they come up to it, unless they have a stealth revealed mechanic, which some factions do. But then also there is Safe Refuge, which means the entire base has a healing aura, which is so good. That's a permanent well. It is a bit pricey, but it's worth it. And lastly, I didn't actually know about this, okay? But the combat training... I didn't read the first line of text which says the quarters increased the resource production of the Citadel by 100%. Currently, the Citadel generates 
40 resources per tick. That's how it's always been. But with this, it goes to 50, to 63, to 80. Like, I, I've n I didn't even realize that existed, but I'm so glad I learned that. But yeah, all the Sanctuary upgrades are worth considering at some point. Plus, especially the great combat training. 100% recruit speed and resources is something you want to, um, to specialize in at some point. Next up, we have the upgrades for Mirkwood, which comes from the Vault of the King building, which also gives you your guards and uh, Thranduil and Legolas. You can get extra money. I recommend getting the, only the wine from Darwinian if you have a second Mirkwood outpost filled with the wine cellars, because that's the only building it gives you extra economy from. And then the same thing with Protect the Borders. If you've got a lot of the troop chambers, get it then. If not, maybe don't think about it. Captain of the Watch is always good, though, because it has a damage... Or an, uh, uh, no, uh, sorry, no, an armor aura only. And then Frenel's Mobilization gives you Call the Horde for Elves. I don't even have to explain how busted that is, but how cheap it is. A tier 3 power for, Mer for Mordor becomes a upgrade for your recruitment building it just gives so much value which can also again be a panic button or a reinforcements button it depends on the situation it just gives you so much versatility it makes the faction hard to compete with in general on to the heroes next we have Rumen and Orofin, the first scout hero that is a pair which allows you to cover more ground They've got increased speed, similar to Merry and Pippin, but they also, again, being two individuals, can be in two places at once, which just boosts Lorien's early game expansion plans, if they can find a good settlement that is not protected by a cave troll. Halvir is still the Jack of All Trades hero for the elves, and he does so even better now. He got extra goodies, which means he gets extra armor, and he can summon units that can just protect an area, making him a perfect tool to just stop an enemy from advancing in a certain enclosure, but also helps activate the Ambush of the Wood Elves ability. So if you're, having str if you're struggling to use the Ambush of the Wood Elves, just get Haldir and practice using his ability with their Ambush. It, it is a really good tool to learn the important mechanics of this faction. Unlike his brethren, Grimbion is much more resistant to archers, which means you can just throw him into the enemy lines, and there's very little that can actually kill him. He's actually kind of a pseudo-hero killer, but also a pseudo-army killer, because of his a later abilities like unleashing the bees. But between his chopping axe and his bear form, he just is a good hero you should always consider getting, and learning how to use, because he is definitely worth it. Quickbeam and Treebeard are kind of a package deal. You get Quickbeam first, just so you can get the enhanced recruitment for Treebeard and all other Ents, since without Treebeard you can't actually get your Catapult Ent. But then you can also have him spawn Battering Ram Ents, the Ash Ents, the baby Ents that stomp. So it's good to have Quickbeam first, Treebeard after, then build some uh, Oak Ents to just lob stones at your opponents while the elves of your faction can just obliterate them from melee. As you might imagine, Legolas is designed to be the best archer in the game with pseudo hero killing abilities like Hawk Strike, extra vision and range to just make sure no one escapes his sight, can train other archers with his skill, but also has his arrow volley which Again, similar to Grimbeorn, just makes it so he can kill light armoured units with very good proficiency. You should always get Legolas if, you're, if you feel like you're missing an essential piece of the kit. Because he just has that everything factor that you really need in, in, in any confrontation. Although Thranduil is known better for all his different abilities that help just keep your army fighting... I want to mention that he does have three unique forms. His defensive stance makes it so he knocks back enemies. His default stance, which is where it takes away his staff, is when he has the highest attack speed. And his aggressive stance is when he wields two swords and does AoE damage. So if you've got a particular enemy you want to keep knocked down, so an elite unit, use the staff. 
you got middle of the road units, or just you, you just don't want to have to focus on him. Just keep him on the basic sword stance. And if you have light troops, put him on his twin sword stance, and he can cut through them like a knife through hot butter. And that's not an exaggeration. Have you seen this man in the movies? He cuts through orcs just constantly. Celeborn is known for one thing and one thing only, and it is what makes him the best hero killer in the game. He can just kill them really, really well. And the more there are around him, the stronger he gets at doing it. Like, literally, every hero near him, his passive makes him stronger. He can pull enemies to enemy heroes towards him so that he can kill them quicker, make himself protected against certain attacks, and then also improve his attack speed. Like, th 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 there's not much else to really say. Just have him in front of heroes and he will kill them all. He will eat them. I, I mean, it's kind of the joke I do is where I just ha say he eats the enemy hero because he they just disappear. They really do. The thing that appeals to me the most about Galadriel is the fact that on her own, she isn't strong. But what she excels in is making her other heroes strong. So that in, in, in itself makes her whole faction stronger. Because that's the kind of thing that some people don't really um, get with Lothlorien. They think Galadriel's meant to be this overwhelming power, which technically she can be using different powers. But her main thing is supporting her faction. She is meant to be the queen. For goodness sake. She is the Lady of Lothlorien. The woman who single-handedly keeps Lothlorien beautiful through everything. She is the... She, she just holds it all together. And that is how she is portrayed in this mod. And I, and I love it. It's definitely a welcome sight to see Galadriel be such a map-wide presence at all times that she actually wants to get you actually want to focus her down because of how powerful she is but at the same time she needs everyone else around her to keep her safe because otherwise she will die she she isn't that tough she does fall down quite quickly without other people keeping her safe and now lastly we come to the powers Mystical Stream, I think, is an amazing power. It gives you vision. It slows down enemies. You just want to, you just want to throw it down whenever it's off cooldown because you'll always get value from it, even if it's just to gain the vision. Also, a little quick tip: if you're going against Isengard, just throw it in an area safe away from any of your buildings. Maybe throw it near one of your enemy buildings because they will throw the explosive mines down where it exists. And then they'll just try and blow it up, but they won't be able to succeed. So that's a funny way of uh, watching Isengard fail. And the Veil of Mist is a good uh, way of getting into a fight or the way of getting out of a fight. Because you can use the Ambush of the Wood Elves with the bonus speed to just run in and obliterate anything. But you should also be careful that um, you might just need to run away in a situation. And that's a good way of using it. The Refuge in the Woods power can be used on both your middle tier power... And on Malon Trees. So use it to just replenish your units. And a funny thing you can do is have a Malon Tree in front of an enemy base. And just use that to block off the enemy. Because the Refuge in the Woods is constantly healing you. Keeping you in that situation. And with Arrow Storm, I feel like the extra armor penetration is really good. Because it just works that well. It's better to not overthink how you use the Arrow Storm. Just throw it down and you get the bonus value straight away. Even if all the things die straight away, that's even better. I'm going to leave these two powers for later. Let's go to Defenders of Mirkwood with Tariel, who can be summoned to then defend a base. Or if you've got an, a rogue hero attacking one of your buildings, just spawn her there on her own. Have her fight it me um, in melee. She might win. And then you can teleport her away to a different location and then spawn her army. Just so she can be in several places at once. Because that is what she excels at the most. Is her, uh, her fast way, her fast movement tools. And then Radagast the Brown has his three different forms. Which means as long as you have, as long as the enemy knows you have Radagast, they have to keep guessing what they will need to worry about. Do you, do you want to have to worry about him on foot with Wizard Blast? 
on his sleigh, which he counts as a very powerful cavalry unit with very little slowdown, or on his eagle, where if they don't have any archers, he can just keep harassing the enemy army constantly. Plus his healing effect should not be forgotten about. It can be used potentially twice in his time on the battlefield. Plus his existence just it, it is a constant disruption to the enemy. Similar to Gandalf for the dwarves. Okay. And now we're going to come to Elvenwood. Which I think is one of the best middle tier powers. Purely because of the value it can give. Not only is it pot uh, capable of being put nearly anywhere on the map with very little restrictions. You can even put it in right in front of a, an enemy base or even your base. And as I mentioned already, use Ravage in the Woods to make give it a healing aura. But they've improved it constantly. The Dying Team have actually made improvements to this power. So now it gives Perma Stealth activation. So you can use Ambush of the Wood Elves as long as you're in the aura. Plus it gives the fear effect of the lanterns that you get from the expansions on Lothlorien's uh, fortresses, which is so good at keeping them around. And now we're going to come to Galadriel's powers, the way she becomes basically her ring forms. She either chooses the way that she rejects the ring and she becomes the Lady of Light, or she accepts the ring and becomes the Queen of Twilight. These are temporary forms. The Queen of Tw Twilight lasts nowhere near as long, but it gives you access to new powers that can be disruptive for the time you need it. It basically makes Galadriel a one woman wrecking machine against an army. Not heroes, mind you. She should she should not be put anywhere near enemy heroes in that form. But then Lady of Light makes her even more powerful as a support character in the fact that her damage aura actually acts as a attack buff for your units, which is so, so, so good. It really does just makes it impossible for your enemies to keep you down because of all that bonus you're getting and then lastly we have our two tier four powers mirrors knowledge super simple permanently reveals the entire map reduces cooldown of all spell powers by 25 percent if you want to be able to keep galadriel permanently in her lady of light form getting this power makes it possible but more importantly is the fact that it permanently reveals the entire map your enemy can never hide from you. You have constant surveillance over everything they do. They know from then on out, they can't hide anything from you. They just need to go gung-ho and attack you if they want a chance of winning. But they have to do it strategically. It forces the enemy to think in so many different ways that it, it makes them struggle to fight against you. And then Vengeance of the Huorns. I think this power is actually... The reason why I've not gotten any value out of it when I'm using it is because I try to use it in tandem with my army. I think Vengeance of the Huorns is a much better ability when used on its own with no end, with no army supporting it. It just needs to be thrown down on the enemy army, disrupt their movement, stop them from being able to do anything. And then from that point on, have your army... Who is not? Who has just been left completely alone because the enemy army is distracted by the Huorns. They can't deal with them. They're stuck in there. They're dying. Your army, fully healed up, no damage, massive speed boosts because it's, you know, it's Lothlorien. You just push into the enemy base. Half the enemy army will never be able to get there in time. And whatever it is com uh, whenever it comes out will be weak. So you can just push in and deal massive damage. It probably works better in PvP purely because players make more mistakes than AI and also players bunch their armies up together more than AI do. But it is still a good power nonetheless in quite a few situations. I've just not been able to use it very well myself. Oh, I need a breath after that one. I hope you've all enjoyed this. I did kind of uh, ramble a little bit on with the powers here, but I have had a lot of experience with Lothlorien in the past. And their current version, I think, is the best they have been since their release, which is when, which is when they weren't even that powerful. They, they, they've, ha they've been moulded into a very fun faction, which 
I can understand people not on, um, being able to play them well because it is a faction you need to invest a lot of time and put everything into them. Put all your chips on the table and just learn them. Accept defeat and just keep learning them. That is the best way to get into this faction because I think a lot of people will love this faction if they get the chance to. Anyway, that's all for today. Farewell.